I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You dare once in your life. Hey, people. Trish Wood here. And this is Trish Wood is Critical. We are talking to you today again about censorship and media. We have a big, big story. And the big story is an interview with a fellow named Kit Clarenberg, who, I mean, this is just incredible. He was um, coming back to his home country of Britain on May 17th, 2023, like recently. Six anonymous plainclothes counter-terror officers detained him They quickly escorted him to a back room where they grilled him for over five hours about his news reporting for the Gray Zone. Max Blumenthal, who runs Gray Zone, has been on this show. He's someone I respect very much. They they do a lot of reporting on um, what they call empire, but regime change wars, foolishness, geopolitical foolishness on behalf mostly of Western governments like America and the UK and occasionally Canada too, who funds a lot of this stuff. They also inquired about his personal opinion on everything from the current British political leadership to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So let me repeat what I just said. An independent journalist flies back into the UK. I think it was at Lutan Airport, not Heathrow, which is what I originally thought. Uh, And he gets off the plane and he's greeted by these sort of security police thingies uh, who take him into a room and interrogate him for five hours about what he thinks and who he works for and what's the gray zone. And and the other thing they did that was even more scary was they took uh, some of his devices, they took his uh, SD cards, Um, They fingerprinted him. They took DNA swabs and photographed him intensively. They threatened to arrest him if he did not comply. Okay. Working indie journalist detained by security police thingies in, in the UK. This is what Gray Zone says about it. Clarenberg's interrogation appears to be London's way of retaliating for the journalist blockbuster reports exposing major British and U.S. intelligence intrigues. In the past year alone, Clarenberg revealed how a cabal of Tory national security hardliners violated the Official Secrets Act to exploit Brexit and install Boris Johnson as prime minister. In October 2022, he earned international headlines with his expose of British plans to bomb the Kert Bridge connecting Crimea to the Russian Federation. Then came his report on the CIA's recruitment of two 9-11 hijackers this April, a viral sensation that generated massive social media attention. So, He set the cat amongst the pigeons, proverbially speaking, and he paid a price for it. And he's facing trouble in the UK. Had to hire a lawyer. They let him go, but he's got this kind of security state sword of Damocles hanging over his head for doing his job as a reporter. And the question is, and we don't know the answer to the question. I asked him, he's not sure, it may be a little of both. Do they really believe that because he is reporting objectively about the Ukraine war, which is that it is a proxy war to get rid of Putin, we all know that now, that he's actually a Putin stooge, which is the playbook? I mean, do they really believe this stuff? Or are they just using that to try to intimidate him into changing the way he's doing his reporting. So we we don't know. He thinks maybe it's a little bit of both. But do stick around, and we will get this whole crazy story from Kit Clarenberg from the Gray Zone website, which is one that I frequently do recommend that you are reading. It might be farther to the left than I am, if there is even such a designation anymore, but um, they do excellent reporting and we have to pay attention. You know, we can't just curate our lives around who we agree with on every issue. That doesn't work. That just means we're living in a silo of 
feeding our own biases already. We have to find people who are doing the actual work of journalism. And we don't have to accept everything they say on every subject, but if they're doing the work, that's who we should be reading and taking seriously. And the gray zone is definitely, definitely one of those places. I know y'all don't agree with everything I say either, but I think you come back every week because you know that the things I do say and talk about are authentically held opinions based on research. Right. So stick around for that. I want to talk to you about something that happened on Twitter too. A couple things happened on Twitter. One of them was I, um, I was kind of taken to the woodshed by some people for correcting a tweet that suggested that certain people mentioned in the tweet weren't actually journalists. They were called journalists, but they weren't actually journalists. And I was attacked for that. Um, and I, I don't know why people thought it was strange that I would I would correct that. If you are a working journalist, you're a working journalist. It means it's what you do for a living. You make a living at it, even if it's a small living, and you you conduct yourself through certain precepts of fairness and accuracy and striving for the truth, even if it doesn't suit your your notion, right? Now, of course, the argument is, well, legacy media journalists aren't doing that. No, they aren't doing that. And that's why we dump on them virtually every week on this program. That does not mean that real actual journalists don't uh, don't exist anymore. They do. Try David Zweig, try Matt Taibbi, try Michael Schellenberger, try Barry Weiss. I mean, there's ton, try AJK. There's tons of them um, who actually are operating the way that journalists should aspire to, in some cases used to. Legacy media is a write-off. We know that. I don't call those people journalists anymore. They're not. But that does not mean that everybody who puts up a shingle saying they're a journalist is a journalist or even a citizen journalist. And I'll tell you why that bugs me a bit, because I know that during the, the riots in Portland, the BLM riots, I interviewed a really good reporter who covered that story. And she told me that some of the Antifa black bloc people were running around with press cards and, and press credentials that they'd created for themselves as citizen journalists in order to, to move about and report what they wanted. So if you're there actually as an activist, because you have a point of view, and then you're saying that you're reporting on it, you're not, you're not a reporter, you may be reporting back information but that's not what being a journalist is, right? A journalist is weighing stuff and not letting a point of view necessarily affect what they're saying and how they're saying it. And also, you know, being a reporter usually requires other skills, including interviewing and writing and, and, and things like that. So maybe I'm old school and I will say if any of the people who were mad at me on Twitter are listening, I mean you no harm. And the fact that you spoke out about the BS around a lot of the COVID public health policy reality and messaging doesn't mean you're not heroic. You are heroic, but I don't think we can just call anybody a journalist who wants to be called a journalist. Maybe that's mean. I'm sorry. But, and maybe I'm old school, which I, I, I clearly am. But um, so that happened <laughs> on Twitter. The other thing I want to talk about is the, what is a woman kind of, flap. So this is the, I think, terrific, terrific documentary by Matt Walsh. Again, I don't agree with everything Matt Walsh at the Daily Wire says and does. He's kind of retro as far as men are concerned. I probably wouldn't want to be in a marriage with him. I think he's really like old school in the marital roles. She wants that. That's fine. I, that's, I support that if that's what they want. I don't agree with them, but that's what they want to do. So fine. But he did a brilliant piece um, on the kind of emperor's new clothes thinking around gender affirmation, psychotherapy and surgery. It's, it's a fantastic film. And he brings to it the kind of satire that Michael Moore brought to Fahrenheit 9-11, Bowling for Columbine these other quite serious documentaries on serious topics that he treated with a bit of satire in order to get you to swallow the real truths, which is exactly what 
what Matt Walsh did in this this film. Anyway, he was Daily Wire was posting it because it's the one year anniversary or something of it. And Twitter was limiting it and putting warnings on it about misgendering and a bunch of stuff. And I thought, wow, are we back here? Is this where we are again with with Elon? Um, I remember the CEO that he has hired, this woman who he met, I think, through an interview she did with him at some event. And she was talking about how advertisers will want to have a say in curating what's on on a platform. And I thought, Ooh, that's dangerous. That's not good. And I, of course I thought that immediately, is that what's happening here? So we are in a situation where some of our free speech heroes are maybe bending a little bit to the practical side because I, look, I know that Twitter has been a real money suck from Elon and, uh, that's terrible. But if you're good, you can't just be a little bit free, right? It's either free speech or it's not. You can't just be a little bit censorious. It's either censorship or it's not. And if people don't like Matt Walsh's film, The Daily Wire's film, what is a woman then argue the merits of the film, argue what his point is. And what happens in the film is he confronts various practitioners of surgeries and the psychotherapy that doesn't look for any other cause of heartache, but, but a gender issue and confronts them with that on a, a kind of a rational basis on a logical basis and says, explain yourself. And they can't explain themselves when confronted with rational thought. They clam up, they end the interview, transphobia, yada, yada. We're seeing this on a whole bunch of topics right now, right? And he exposes that. That's what he does in the film. So if everybody who is mad about the film thinks he's wrong, then marshal your argument about where he's wrong. And I'm sure that people will put it up on Twitter. So that was kind of upsetting to to see, again, yet more struggles. And... I believe that one of the Twitter people who's in charge of that sort of thing quit or something over it. I don't know. But gosh, it's just climbing this hill. The information wars are really, really scary right now. They, I feel like we're fighting them on every front. But listen, there are no heroes. People are going to let you down. So, you know, be careful. Don't line up behind people thinking that they're going to get you out of this. You've got to really see what you can do, curate your own informational feeds and make sure also that you're taking in information from smart people that you disagree with too. That's really important. So, okay, I'm going to do my pitch and then we're going to get to this amazing interview with Kit Clarenberg. We're so, everybody wanted this guy and we got him. So, uh, Max Blumenthal from the Gray Zone facilitated that, and I'm very, very grateful. But here's our pitch, um, and it's good that it follows a bit of a rant from me about uh, freedom of speech and fighting censorship at every single turn, because that's what we try to do here. We we really do. We hope we've been a bit of a beacon of light during the three years of COVID misinformation and disinformation on their part, not ours. We suffered the same slings and arrows supporting people who were right on certain aspects of it, who were maligned through ad hominem attacks. No one took them on over data. That's when I knew something was fishy. Because the people who were being critical of COVID-19 policy, like Jay Bhattacharya and the rest, you know who I'm talking about, the ones who got it right, Scott Atlas, were attacked in very, very personal ways and not about what they were saying about focused protection and really actually saving the people who are at risk and letting the people who weren't at risk, which is like most of us, go on about their business so the you know, the economy wouldn't collapse and the suicides wouldn't happen and the cancers wouldn't be missed, et cetera, et cetera. You know the story. We've been talking about it three years. So this is about freedom of speech and anti-censorship. And that's how it manifested itself for three years. And we are 
somewhat tired, as I'm sure you are too, but on we go. And it's important to call Elon out on how he treats the Daily Wire in this film. As I say, you cannot be a little bit censorious. You're either in or you're out, Elon. So I know that you're maybe lost more money than I will ever see. But those of us who are sticking our heads up over the parapet on this vitally, vitally important issue of our time are paying a price for it. We're all paying a price for it. Some of us got rich, not me, but some of us have gotten rich. Um, but most of us have paid a price. And so Elon might have to get used to a little bit of pain here and there if he's going to do, do this properly. So how can you support us? Substack is the way we have a Patreon. We're trying to move people over from Patreon to Substack. It is a free speech platform. Um, I write a piece on Substack every week or so, but it is primarily a funding platform for this, the podcast, which is where the bulk of the effort is going right now. The reason I do that is because it is a free speech platform and so far so good. So far so good with Substack. I have a website, which is trishwoodpodcast.com. There's a merch store. Uh, there ha- we have some great hats and t-shirts and things. Some of it is still trucker merchandise and I still like to see that. It makes me happy. And it reminds me of those golden days when we actually thought that protesting from our side might make a difference. <laughs> How wrong we were. Anyway, so, and I have a, um, I have a Twitter account, obviously it's at Wood Reporting. I have an Instagram too, so you can find me there. And I hope that you do. I know that you get asked a lot probably by indie media and podcasters and substackers to, to support them. And, um, it does matter. It does matter. I didn't put any barriers to accessing content up for about two and a half years because it was COVID, it was medicine. And I thought we were saving lives, but now in order to continue, I can't subsidize it anymore. We've got to start, we've got to start uh, monetizing as they say. So that's why the pitch. And um, I'd be very grateful for your consideration. Like I say, I know you get asked a lot. So here is my interview with Kit Clarenberg from the gray zone talking about his encounter with counter terror police who detained him at uh, an airport in Britain very, very recently. It's a nightmare. Hi, Kit. How are you? Um, uh, recovery. Uh, for, for one, yeah. Phrase. But yes, no, I'm all right. What, what does that mean, recovering? What, what, what are you feeling? Um, well, I mean, it, it was, uh, I mean, some, somehow unsurprising, but still a shock um, that I got stopped, particularly in the highly invasive you know, manner that I did and on the grounds that I did. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I mean, as I, um, uh, as Max mentioned in his write up of this, you know, I, I effectively remain under, um, criminal investigation, quite what for isn't clear. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I have a Guantanamo to look forward to, um, at some point in the future, but, um, yeah, aside from that, um, the, the fight goes on. Well, this is a big deal. I mean, even for people who don't read the gray zone, you should be reading the gray zone, but if you're not. It's just a big deal because when I saw, uh, I think I saw it in a tweet of Max's that this had happened. I thought, wow. So they were arresting journalists who disagree with the NATO approach to Ukraine. Really? Is that <laughs> what's happening now? This is a massive, massive thing. And I want people to understand that, that bad prop- propaganda is not just about lying to you, but it's about silencing people who aren't lying to you. And that's what's happening around Ukraine. And Kit had the, well, I would say at this point, misfortune to be someone who was kind of sticking their neck out to bring you information that the, you know, this kind of massive neocon state in the West didn't want you to know and he paid a price for it. So, so tell me what happened to you? You were flying from where into where, and then when did the trouble start? Sure. So um, I uh, I live in Serbia. I'm, I was born in um, I was born in London, and I, I moved to Serbia uh, almost four years ago now. 
And so I, I mean, I have no particular professional or personal reason to be in the UK. I mean, obviously I have friends and family there. Uh, and I wouldn't have gone, gone back at all were it not for the fact that um, one of my uh, close relatives is very, very ill and, you know, I might not you know, see them ever again. So I, um, I, I intended to go back for, just for a few days. Um, I, I flew back on May, May 17th. Um, as we pulled into Luton, which is you know, one of the worst worst airports in the world by by, by some margin, um, you know, the hottest places in hell have, have very little on on Luton Airport. Um, I, where is it? It's, Kit, where is Luton? Um, I mean, it's it's probably about it's about an hour hour and a half from London. Um, okay. Yeah, and so I mean, it's it's one of the it's uh, it's 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 where kind of budget airlines fly into from from Europe typically. But they, they essentially, yes. Yeah. So when we, we we touched down and the um, uh, the pilot said over the tannoy, um, you know, everyone have your everyone have your passports ready um, because uh, the border control is just around the corner. Now, in all my naivety, I kind of there, there was part of my my, my, my mind that was like, oh, has, has it been, has the airport been um, uh, re landscaped, <laughs> restructured since I was last here? Um, yeah, yeah. No, no such luck. Um, you know, pretty much the second that, that we, we descended from the tarmac, there was a team of plain clothes officers checking everyone's passports. Um, they checked mine, and then I was immediately t um, ordered to uh, come with them. And then I was you know, frog marched through the terminal, uh, flanked by um, uh, six um, um, officers. And they uh, uh, took me to a back room and told me that I was being held under Schedule 3 of the 2019 Terrorism Act, um, which is a sweeping bit of legislation, which is typically, I think that, I, I think this might be the very first time that the journalist has ever been subject to it. Um, and it's, it specifically relates to state threats um, uh, and, uh, and, yes, the kind of you know, threats to UK national security. And it's... The, the the wording of it is it's kind of it's as if they, the British authorities took um, 1984 as a blueprint rather than um, a warning. So it, it effectively, it states you are not under criminal investigation and therefore not under arrest. Uh, but for this reason, you do not have the right to remain silent. Um, so wow. I, 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 if I had failed, refused to answer any of their questions, I would have been arrested and potentially jailed for up to a year. Um, and I, I might add, yes, that the, uh, effectively, that the, you know, the, the UK was the country that invented the right to silence, which is a, a yeah. universal, um, international, at least in theory, um, legal principle. And was at one point in British history was so um, rigidly enforced that uh, suspects in criminal trials couldn't testify in their defence, you know, in, in case their words were used against them somehow or twisted. Yeah, and yeah. so, um, but the, and so, th this also applied to compliance with requests to hand over personal information, as such as the PIN codes to my um, electronic devices. I didn't have a computer with me because I didn't intend to doing any work, um, and so that was my you know, my phone and my tablet and but also my sim cards um and they must i mean quite what they did with them i'm not sure uh, they took them out of the room and then asked, asked for the pin code so they must have broken into them and done something but but also as well the, the, i mean just on the subject of state threats the, the wording is it, again it's just completely incredible so it states that is immaterial whether a person is aware they are engaged in host hostile activity. And it is also immaterial whether a foreign state, in the interest of which a hostile act is carried out, is aware of the carrying out of the act. So apparently you can be guilty of posing a state threat without you or the state you're allegedly serving knowing. I just want people to fully understand what we're listening to here. So Kit arrived at an airport just outside of London and was taken into a room by six people now the six people how what did they look like what were they wearing and how did they identify themselves to you because you must have been thinking what the hell is going on here yeah well i mean they they, they just looked like average people really i mean they weren't like these kind of you know, hul you know hulking thugs um you know they were they, one of them was was a woman um but yeah the, you know they, they they just wore plain clothes um i might add that yes i wasn't allowed to learn their names i only i only learned their call signs so it was like you know would and at one point they seemed to forget each other's call signs which is very bizarre. It's just, yeah, sorry, B1, can you pass me that bit of paper, please? Like, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, so it was all, I mean, yeah, like that in itself is quite disturbing. I mean, it does raise the, 
raised the prospect that that, that they might that, that, that there might have been um, members of MI5, which is Britain's domestic security service, um, uh, among them. So yes, I don't know who these who these people were really, but the, yeah, the, I, and which was all the more perverse given the wide array of deeply intrusive questions that I was asked by them. And like, okay, you know, let's. I want to get yeah. to the questions, but let me just I just so people fully understand here. So what did they say to you about? who they were and what they were doing and what is the basis you, you mentioned is, is this a ter- an anti-terrorism doctrine that they, or edict that they are enforcing? What, what category of detainment did they tell you this was? Well, yeah, as I say, it was under schedule three of the, of a British, of a relatively recent British terrorist act, which is, I mean, in the UK since the year 2000, um, interesting timing, has passed a number of uh, sweeping um, counter-terror laws, which are, you know, among the most stringent in in the world. Um, I mean, in the Western world, the UK is streets ahead in terms of, you know, like, dr- dr- draconian restrictions on speech and all sorts of other things. And you guys have security cameras in virtually every, every building. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing is that the the uh, a lot of the you know, many of these laws have been ruled unlawful by you know the European Court of Human Rights. So, for instance, yeah. for a very long time, Britain had. Um, uh, it was, you know, I mean, probable cause is another, you know, very you know, well-established um, legal concept. That was done away with under, under terrorism laws in Britain. So um, for any reason, you know, police could stop you and search you and, and ask you questions with, again, yes, threat of arrest for failure to comply. Um, wow. You know, and I, as a teenager in London was frequently stopped under these powers just for no apparent reason other than, you know, the high crime of being young in a public place. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, yeah. it's very, I mean, that was struck, struck down as illegal. And I think that the, the British government, as in so many matters, its attitude was to, to effectively just ignore um, the, the, the ruling that, st- that stated this was, you know, completely egregious. So yes, um, and it, 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 you, I, I, in conversations with my lawyer, it seems that yes, that these these powers are not particularly tested. In ter- I mean, in, in terms of their application, it, they, yeah, they've never been applied uh, to you know to a jour- to a, 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 a British journalist. At least there was a case recently where a French publisher flew in. Uh, no, I don't even think he flew in. I think that he, he got the Eurostar from Paris and then he got stopped and then uh, he ended up getting arrested because he refused to hand over his passwords to his electronic devices. But it's like yeah. in the US, you, the, the border patrol, uh, sorry, border police do have uh, the the right to digitally strip search people, so to speak. But this happens fairly rarely. I mean, and there is a high degree of ra- uh, you know, racial profiling in it. Um, you know, if you're from the Middle East or you look like you are, um, yeah. you know, in the eyes of the of uh, ice, um, then you know. But I, I again, I think that these cases are somewhat rare. But the UK prides itself in a very perverse way on of having these these powers to seize your uh, electronic data. And like, I mean, you know, I was fingerprinted, I was uh, photographed. They had DNA swabs. Um, you know, it was all incredibly invasive. And this one. Uh, this one officer who had a, a Northern Irish accent, make of that what you will, um, <laughs> said, uh, "Well, yeah, right. if your if your fingerprints weren't found on an IED in Afghanistan, then we delete all this data in six months," which uh, wasn't very convincing, actually, <laughs> or, or reassuring. Oh yeah, yeah, I sure, buddy. But let, let me ask you this, just. Um just sure. because I can't, I can't imagine myself being, I mean, I was pulled into the bad, scary room at an airport trying to get into the state once states once, and that I was terrified. Nothing bad happened. I was just like freaked out sitting in the room. So I can imagine what happened, what was happening in your head. But do, are, do, do, do you, did you kind of do this? Do I have a right to call counsel? Do I like what, 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 what kind of conversations were you having and how were they putting down the idea that you must have some rights in this situation to not comply? Well, I mean, I must say that the, they, the, the, the officers who interviewed me, there were two, two of them, while the others did whatever they did behind closed doors with all my devices, they yeah. were very professional and courteous and they, they re- repeated, frequently reminded me that I did have the right to, you know, le- legal counsel, which I didn't, um, which I didn't um, elect to take, even though I did have my um my lawyer's number written down um in 
uh, yeah, on a bit of paper in my in my wallet. Funnily enough, they they specifically asked me what that was, as if it was some suspicious um, um, a bit of evidence or something. But they, I mean, they, 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 at the same time, I do wonder whether their um, uh, charm offensive was you know, intended to put me at ease. It was a kind of interrogation yeah. tactic to make me me think that oh, we're just having a friendly chat here rather than me being interrogated. And or, I mean, yeah. also as well, like I might yes that they. Um, uh, they specifically asked, oh, well, you know, do you have any journalistic materials with you? And if so, um, where are they? So, you know, so we don't pick them up by accident. And it's like, well, I mean, I'm fairly sure they were just trying to get me to lead them directly to, um, you know, in, <laughs> uh, material that I've reported on or intend to report on. Um, so, so, so did you get, this is maybe a weird question, but did, did you get the sense at any time that you could have just walked out and not cooperated or that if you tried to walk out, there would have been a consequence? I'm, I'm just wondering what the mood was like in, in the room, aside from the fact that you were probably quite destabilized by what was happening. Oh, well, I mean, no, there was, there was no prospect of that. I mean, I would have been arrested. Like, you would I, have, I, okay. I, was being, wow. I was detained under terrorism. Wow. Wow. And did they use that word detained under terrorism? Blah, blah. Yeah, did yeah, they? Yeah. Is that, wow. Yeah. Wow, I mean, wow. I, I, Max, um, uh, in, in his, uh, in his write up on this, he, he, um, included a photo of the um, the form that I was given, and it goes into details about well your your rights or lack thereof, um, and yes, the fact that, that I am being held on suspicion of posing a state threat, even if I don't know it or intend to, um, which was pr- you know, pretty incredible, really. But I think that yeah, that the, 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 the they had uh, on the one hand they'd clearly looked into me before and, and been keeping an eye on my work for some time. Um, but then on the other, they, there were clear, there were clear, there were, it was a fishing expedition and there were very clear gaps in their knowledge that they were seeking to fill about, um, the, the nature of, of, of gray zone and indeed my work. And I mean, uh, so I, I, it, it, effectively, once, once they'd you know taken all of my devices and everything, uh, and uh, you know my, my pins, they made me draw on a bit of paper the the pattern I draw to get into my tablet, which I use for reading um, ebooks and stuff. Um, you know nothing, yes, nothing sinister. Yeah. Um, they yeah. then started asking me a lot of questions, and it was it was it, 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 it was what's the word? It, it was just it was just endlessly. Um, uh, enlarging the kind of sphere of questions they ask. So, you know, um, are you in touch with any current or former Russian state media employees? Do you have any Russian friends? Do you speak Russian? Do you speak any foreign languages? Do you own property abroad? Where do you live in Serbia? What's your address? How much do you pay in rent? Is your Are your energy bills included in your rent? Um, and then it just went on and on and on. Uh, you know, what are your political opinions? Um, what is your view on the war in Ukraine? Um, the, the, uh, you know, what do you think of uh, Rishi Sunak, who's the British Prime Minister? What, what do you think of Keir Starmer, who's the British you know, opposition leader? And then there were some very, very specific questions about, about Grazer. Now, I might add, they asked me what websites I, I wrote for. And yeah. um, and I, I list because it is a large, you know, it's a, a large number of them. I listed them, and they said, um, "Well, we want to talk to you about all of those." But then, actually, in the event, the only questions were about Grey Zone. So, how is Grey Zone funded? Who owns it? Have you met Max Blumenthal? Um, the, uh, the, the, the does do have you or anyone at Grey Zone ever knowingly had contact with a member of the Russian intelligence services? Does Grey Zone have an agreement with the FSB, which is Russian, Russia's federal security service, to publish hacked documents. I mean, I kind of had to suppress a laugh at that point, which is about the only kind of glimmer of <laughs> glimmer of uh, amusement in the five-hour grilling, because it was just such a ludicrous proposition. And there, I mean, there was also, you know, uh, I, when they, they made me go through the process of how um, we receive leaks or, you know, um, tips, which is, you know, via email, um, and we've you know, been clear about that in the past. And they asked, 
whether um, you know does anyone else have access to the gray zone server apart from um, max himself does anyone have access to the email address like it just went on and on and on and I, there was another there was a there was a um, a, por- a portion where, the, where they 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 asked uh, of the interview where they asked at length about my you know professional qualifications and whether i was part of any um uh, international journalism uh, unions or, or organizations and they specifically asked you know what kind of benefits and protections I, I, I would get from being part of the, the Britain's National Union of Journalists and all this other stuff and there was a sense that that kind of got my um, alarm bells it got alarm bells ringing in my mind because obviously you know one of the core smears against Julian Assange which has been used to delegitimize his work and justify his incarceration is this claim that he's not a journalist yeah. yeah, despite the fact that he's won numerous pre- prestigious journalism awards and holds a um, Australian journalist union press card and has done for many years, it's like so. I, I mean, I also wonder whether they were trying to trying to gauge, um, uh, you know, how much trouble they might be in if I publicise this. And uh, the the, the, the um, I think as well that the, the, what, what another really uh, what I, I I found it quite exhausting, but they went they went over with me for for almost an hour um my professional history and like gaps in my cv dating back to when i left university which is you know th- nearly 13 years ago now and yeah. so it was and my my background is that i started off as a as a lowly um financial um hack because uh, because that you know, they were the people who got back to me when i when i applied uh you know, yeah. for any particular reason and then you know, I, I eventually um, transitioned into national security uh, reporting, bearing in mind that I studied politics at university and had a, uh, an interest in this stuff anyway. And I, I kept abreast of developments, even though that wasn't my beat, so to speak, in professional terms. They kept on coming back to, you know, what, how did you get into political journalism, what, despite the fact you started off in, in finance? How? Well, you know, why? What was the process there? And they really drilled me on that. And I do wonder whether there was a sense of, you know, were they trying to gauge whether I'd been recruited at some point or, oh. or if there was a, um, if I'd been a, a sleeper agent all along. And it's like, you know, be, yeah, as I said, like you're bearing in mind, I'd made very clear that I had an interest in, in this kind of thing anyway. It's just really, really you, you know, I, I, I think the more, more generally there is this Cold War mindset at the moment, which infects everything, whereby, yeah. you know, this, this spooks are very good at spooking themselves. And, you know, seeing patterns and connections where there are none. And then, you know, now, ever since the start of the war in Ukraine, um, that is being projected onto wider society in ways that are really damaging and dangerous. Well, you know what? I blame Hillary Clinton for this. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> well, no, I mean she started it, right? There, you know, Putin was not the boogeyman he is today until she started with the Trump is controlled by Putin narrative, which, you know, I mean she was over there with a let's restart our friendship button a year before she was saying that he was controlling you know, Trump like a marionette, and it's gone on from there. They've used that narrative. They're all using that narrative. I'm so glad that you um, mentioned Julian, because I was going to say just before you said it, that it's a very short drive from what happened to you to Belmarsh, in a sense. Like, right? I mean, indie journalists, I here's what I think is happening for what it's worth. I, I think that the people in legacy media now who are so aligned with the national security state apparatus and they know they're losing the argument to people like you, right, are able to kind of sick the state on you and others in a way that makes what you do even more dangerous. All of this disinformation, misinformation, you know, we've got to have censorship against indie, blah, is all driven by the fact in, in one sense that legacy media is failing and people are starting to not believe them anymore, especially on stories like Ukraine. And that's very scary to me because it means that the journalists who are pushing back by doing actual reporting are in peril, not just obviously in a war zone, but but by the state that doesn't like people like you poking holes in what legacy media is saying. 
Yeah, precisely. And I think that one of the key one of the key things as well is that like the it, that we've done at the grey zone. I mean, I, I've probably taken the lead on it. Is that we've exposed we've exposed this this conflict for what it is, which is yes, a uh, Western proxy war that has been provoked and fomented and is you know currently being facilitated and 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 and, and greatly escalated by Western powers, of which Britain is um, uh, is taking the lead. Um, you know, some of the some of the material that that, w- that that we've received as leads has in has very clearly indicated that Britain is pushing very aggressively far in excess of the Biden administration's alleged caution to really escalate things to World War three levels in Ukraine and um, and it to, to the extent of, of actively seeking to undermine the Biden administration um, and to kind of shame them and pressure them in, in, into ramping this up as much as possible to levels which are supremely dangerous. Um, there is a quote from, there's a senior British military advisor called, called Chris Donnelly, who is uh, kind of almost a bet noir of mine. I've been reporting on his uh, uh, wicked dealings for, for, for a very long time. And there is a... Um, the, 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 in an email exchange with a senior British um, military official, they openly talk about um, what well, you know, needing to escalate things as much as possible, and, it, the, and to, to challenge the Biden administration's caution at all costs. Um, and then we need, rather than de-escalation, we need to escalate, escalate, escalate. Now, this doesn't fit into the narrative of plucky Ukraine fighting this war of <laughs> you know, this war in defence of European values and freedom and democracy, and yeah. you know, Britain um, just as a as a, as a as a friend and and uh, protector, um, you know, helping Ukraine. Like they, you know, they 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 pretty much you know, openly state that they are that they are doing this to they are doing this to destroy Russia and are perfectly willing to expend as many Ukrainian lives as possible in the process. And so, of course, they don't want that in the public domain. But also, I think that they they that they are very keen that this is not seriously investigated because the the risks that this is posing in so many ways to oh. the, the to the average people in the West are almost unquantifiable. Now, what to give you an example, and this is, uh, you know, on in hindsight, it's twenty twenty. I should have I should have raised this with my um, with my interrogators when they they said, oh well, you know, your reporting might be interesting to the public, but it's not in the public interest. Now, I mean, which is I mean, we can get into that later. An absolutely shocking um, uh, suggestion. But the, uh, so recently for the grey zone, I investigated how two French neo Nazis were arrested um, uh, upon their return from Kiev in in Paris, and they had a, a, a number of weapons and ammunition with them. These were people who were known to the French security services as dangerous, violent people who went to fight in, in Ukraine. And a large number of, of, of fascists from all over um, Europe have, have, have gone there to do so. And, um, you know, the obvious, the, the, the obvious reason that they had you know, this material with them was that they were planning terrorist attacks at home. And, you know, in the, the rewind to, this, I think it was November last year, my friend and colleague Alex Rubenstein reported on how Italian police had broken up a um, uh, terror cell in, uh, near Naples, which had been planning to carry out mass shootings and bombings of, su- of uh, shopping malls. And they were linked to Azov Battalion, which is, yes, the notorious neo-Nazi Ukrainian paramilitary unit. But they'd also, they were also in direct contact with Centuria and Right Sector. These are two more fascist paramilitary units that Britain and America have been training and arming for years. Now, it, 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 it is very, very obvious that the more, the longer this goes on, the more weapons flow in, um, and indeed, the, the more likely it becomes that the that Ukraine is going to be forced into a defeat when the US gets bored of this um, and decides to throw Ukraine under the bus, which could be relatively soon. Actually, there's going to be a large number of battle hardened. Um, and extremely bitter neo-Nazis, and you know, due to the, the vast, unaccountable um, weapon shipments flowing into Ukraine, yeah. which Europol has already reported are can be found in profusion on arms black markets. Uh, the, you know, the, the, it's a matter of when, not if, there is a major or a series of major terrorist attacks in Western countries. 
by these individuals. Um, in I think it was the end of last year, or was it the start? Of, I mean, they were they were convicted at the start of this year. There were two members of this this U.S. neo-Nazi group called um, Atom Atomwaffen, which is it, 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 it has ties to Azov Battalion. Its members went to fight in, uh, sorry, went to train with Azov Battalion in Ukraine, and they have numerous connections to uh, neo-Nazi groups elsewhere. They were the, 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 its leader and his his wife or girlfriend were convicted of planning to blow up the electricity supply of Baltimore, and they were doing so explicitly uh, because it was a majority black city um, in winter in order to deprive residents of heat and light, which is you know would obviously be life threatening in the event of a of a, of a, of a rough winter. And um, this was basically unremarked upon. By U.S. officials, and it was ignored by the media. And this is at the same time that the Biden administration is ramping up fears of domestic right-wing extremism to justify crackdowns on, um, you know, alternative media <laughs> or you know, on um, on campaign yes. groups, um, on, yeah. you know, on on um, on political action. And yet, it was ignored. And so it's like, well, I mean, yes, our, our reporting is very much in the public interest. We are trying to warn people <laughs> of what is almost inevitable at this point. I mean, again, in Britain, in uh, late last year, there was a report from Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee, which warned that there was a high risk of a large number of uh, far-right fighters returning from cu- country redacted, but obviously Ukraine. Um, and there was no, and it's, it, it, the report warned that there was no mechanism in place to monitor these people when they returned. This, again, received no interest whatsoever from politicians or the mainstream media. So in that context, we are trying our best to do a public service. Um, you know, but, the, but again, it's like the, it, the, 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 the fact that, Brit, that Britain and, and the US have been doing this in Ukraine for so long, it messes with the narrative of you know, the freedom-loving Ukrainians who desperately want nothing to do with Russia, who are being who have been invaded for no reason other than Putin's this kind of diabolical Bond villain type character. Yeah, I mean it's it's shocking because when the when Russia first invaded and we, you know, we had people from Consortium News on and others who were quite aware of the you know the backstory and and how this was very likely a proxy war to get rid of Putin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there was some phrases about Putin was saying the denazification of Ukraine. Everybody said, you know, the legacy media, social media, oh, that's, what are you talking, there's no Nazis there, what are you, you know, I mean, it was really shocking, the pushback about it, and of course these things end up being true, but but the level of propaganda around this war, probably because of social media and probably because of the utter corruption of legacy media, has been so profound. I mean, it's, I would say that 90% of the people awake in the world right right now have no idea what's going on actually in Ukraine. They don't. They may be stopping their support for it because it's costing too much, but I don't think they actually understand what's really going on and why. Indeed. And it's like the, and I think that um, we, it, it, what's really interesting to me as well is that the um, in, uh, in 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 Serbia most of the media is absolutely terrible. It's either funded by um, the Serbian state or it's funded by the you know National Endowment of Democracy or the British Foreign Office, and, and in, in, <laughs> yeah. for, in, in, for the purposes of regime change. But I, the, yeah. in um, it, the, 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 what alternative media exists has been you know very clear from day one, and it's not been you know. Um, um, lockstep support for um, f- for the war. In fact, there's been an awful lot of condemnation. I mean, Serbs have you know they, they live with you know, m- many many people um, within living memory. Um, you know, were bombed by NATO, and you know, the effects of that are still felt to this day. But they were very clear that this has been you know a desperate situation for the Ukrainians since day one. Whereas the entire Western media has just been you know relentlessly pub- publishing you know tales, no matter how ridiculous, of you know. You Ukrainian heroism and success and um, yeah. you know, Russian embarrassment and failure. And like, you know, um, it was an interesting paradigm shift but where I think in, in January this year, uh, RAND, which is a very influential Pentagon-funded think tank, published a... Um, 
it, it published a report called Avoiding a Long War, which effectively amounted to an urgent demand for the US to get the hell out of Dodge um, in Ukraine because it was saying that this is, yeah. this is running the risk of direct conflict between NATO and Russia and nuclear escalation. Um, there is no way Ukraine can win, um, there, let alone... Uh, you know, recover the 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 territory it's lost, um, and it also there was a lot of you know, it also said that well you know we basically need to prepare for war with China, and this is taking up too much of the Pentagon's energy. And then you know, pretty much overnight, the, the media narrative changed to okay, well actually this is a really desperate situation for the Ukrainians, and you know they've lost vast amounts of men and material, and like you know Russia is basically unscathed by this. And like the response that I've seen, I mean, admittedly it's a bunch of idiots on the internet, but it's still quite interesting. Is that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of people who were. Um, uh, you know, kind of, they had this kind of state of cognitive dissonance when, when you know, in response to these stories on Twitter and in the comment section, they would be like, "Well, this must be, this must be fake. Ukraine is winning. How can this be true?" And it's just, like, yes. well, yeah, like I mean, people yeah. are not people are kind of at the uh, on the on the stage where they're beginning to question what they're being told. And I think there's, you know, there's an enormous number of people who. Are, are, are potentially going to be psychologically scarred when, you know, if and when, the, well, whenever this and however this ends, but when they get to grips with the extent to which they were lied to, because you know, as I say, for the probably for the, you know, the, the first year of this, there was no sense that this was anything other than a you know sterling, um, miraculous underdog success for, for oh, noble, 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 absolutely. You know, meanwhile, meanwhile, like you know, however, however many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians have been killed, that their economy has been destroyed, um, that, that you know, the, the, the pe- people's lives have been ruined, their, their population has collapsed by perhaps even 50% at this point. Oh, 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 I know. It's just, it's brittle. Um, right. It's a noble cause. And there's a lot of cognitive dissonance going around these days, I will tell you, because we've been reporting very critically on COVID public health policy for three years too. And there is, there, you remember the meme about I support the current thing? Um, and and the first time I thought I saw it, I thought, wow, that's really smart because the Ukraine flags went up in the in the Twitter bios instantly based on the propaganda. Mm. Um, and, right. And and people didn't even question. It was just this is the, the right and moral thing to do. And we must not ask questions and we must not think anything except that these, you know, the Ukraines are noble and Zelensky is Churchill. And Putin is Hitler, and that's what we're doing here. And that's what they've been doing. So I, I think your assessment of that people will be suffering cognitive dissonance when this thing finally um, unfolds itself is absolutely true. But I think it's one of many issues people are suffering cognitive dissonance about. And I, I've said this on the show before, but people are made... I think gravely mentally ill by the level of propaganda on really important things that we are subjected to now. And um, that's why I admire guys like you and, and Max and what you're doing at the gray zone, because you're, you're doing something that is terrific, but, but also has an even higher purpose, I think, than, than regular journalism, because you're going so far against the grain at a time when lies are king. It's, it's really astonishing. Let's get back to um, to your encounter there at the airport. How long were you there, and why? How how did you get out of there? How, how did when did they let you go, and under what what caution? Well, yeah. So essentially, they, they um, after five hours, they've they've seemingly run out of questions. I mean, it, it just it, I think it got to the point where they just they, they literally didn't have anything to ask, and they were playing for time because going through all of my digital devices was taking so long. And it's, I might add that I. Um, I, I, I'm a, uh, a passionate hobbyist photographer and I had um, a, a, a camera and some memory card with me. Um, mm-hmm. um, the, I didn't even know I actually had, had some of those memory cards with me. And they, I think that they were going through um, file by file, their content. So, you know, pity whoever drew the short straw and had to, um, you know, de- pour over t- photos of architecture I've taken in, in Europe over, you know, many years, um, <laughs> you know, in, 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 on the hunt for something suspicious. But the, yeah, the, the essentially that 
they they because it was taking so long they said they would keep my tablet and my um uh and what and my and two of my memory cards i think uh for um uh, for, for a further week for um uh for investigation and and then when i i went to collect uh went to collect them from from the airport and i was told that um well we're actually going to keep uh, one of your memory cards which was attached to my phone and, I, and at least to my mind contain mainly contain music and it's very very old um you know kind of five six years old but then yes they can they can keep they can get most things which have been deleted off these things so i mean again god knows what they've actually got their hands on um and yes that's being held indefinitely they've not they wow. they, they stated specifically this was because uh, they felt it may be necessary to criminal proceedings um which is again just a, a pure fishing expedition stuff you know this is not why my property was taken in the first place um and quite where that's going to lead i'm not sure um my lawyer has spoken of potentially launching a, a legal challenge to that um because i yeah i mean it's just kind of plainly ridiculous that they would you know, keep keep your property that long on kind of indeterminate vague grounds um so but yes you know i'm still effectively under investigation um i Again, um, you know, this kind of you know, feeds my anxiety a bit, um, you know, what comes next or indeed um, whether they you know, might try and pin something on me, particularly because I've you know, had the temerity to go public with all of this. Um, and, you know, they, you know the, the level of the level of, um, of outcry and response has been actually quite remarkable. I mean, I even had organizations like um, uh, RSF, you know, Reporters Without Borders. Um, they got in touch with me um, on, on the day that Max responded, and you know, they may well, may, may well publicise this, and, and they're, they're at least logging it and going to, you know, they kind of well, they claim to have my back. So, I mean, I think that that's quite yeah. remarkable. But I mean, I think that you know, more, what's even more meaningful is there were you know, literally thousands of people reached out to me one way or another, whether it was via Twitter or email or you know whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's very either a, you know, a large number of independent journalists and, and independent media outlets like. Um, um, uh, uh, like to classified UK, who do fantastic um, you know, anti-establishment work in Britain. Um, you know, they, they they specifically made a stink about this. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's situations like this where you where you work, you learn who your friends are. And I, it seems that I have a great many of them, inclu- including people with whom I couldn't disagree more politically, and who I've yeah. crossed words with in the past. Because I think that yeah, you know, it, I think this is this is another thing. You know, you mentioned disinformation. But the, you know, one of the, the, this this has been a through line ever since we kind of, kind of when Russia got going and then this was the kind of, this was effectively the, uh, the battering or I'm used by the deep state to get their, their, the foot in the door of, of Twitter and, 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 you know, in order to, so, so the state, so the, the British and American governments could effectively dictate to major social networks and tech firms what they could and couldn't host. And indeed they could compel these companies, these private companies we hear so much about um, to, uh, to just remove content because they didn't like it. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, it, 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 I think we've had so many examples of this happening whereby, we, you know, when one, you know, one, one person, say Alex Jones, gets deplatformed and then, you know, all of these kind of liberals and Democrats are cheering this and saying this isn't a free speech, issue, this is about hate speech or whatever. And then someone they actually like gets censored in the same way and suddenly it's the worst thing to ever happen and blah, and it's absolutely yeah. and awful. And it's like, this has happened so many times now that people, you know, people aren't stupid. They, 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 they've very much wised up to what the what game is afoot here. And I think that the, you know, and yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I think that the war in Ukraine has prompted more people to seek out independent media, which is you know why we're such a threat. Um, and and uh, you know I might, I might add as well that the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the way that authorities deal deal with this stuff, whether it's under the aegis of disinformation or indeed you know just threatening and harassing reporters, such as in my case, not only is it completely counterproductive because there's almost a Streisand effect. And then, you know, you have, I mean, I've had a large number of people reach out saying, I've never heard of you and I've never read The Grey Zone, but I'm now a paid subscriber. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 it's just, you know, this, this stuff yeah. applies because it puts more, it puts more eyes on, on, on what we're doing. Uh, but also as well, I think that it, it, it's also counterproductive because, it, you know, it, it will give states like Russia or, you know, um, or China or, or whoever the um, ammunition 
uh, in order to justify repression of Western journalists and their own, or critical journalists within their own borders. And, you know, I mean, I was specifically asked about the arrest of Aaron, uh, um, Evan Gershevich, who was the Wall Street Journal reporter who was jailed in Russia, and what I thought about that and, and what my colleagues thought about that. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 I condemned it at the time. I don't think, I, you know, I, it's, I, I suggest that that's being done for political purposes, and he's probably going to be used as leverage in a swap of some kind. But, you know, the, 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 yes, that you know, my, my detention will be used uh, in, uh, in order to further narratives about Western hypocrisy and actually how... Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, she must be sitting over there laughing his head off. Yes. And, yeah. and, <laughs> right. And it's just like it, it is. Yes. I, I, I almost guarantee you that that my experience will be cited in justification of jailing or harassing um, independent journalists in, in, in other foreign countries. I mean, already I've had numerous um, you know, f- um, f- uh, f- foreign state funded media outlets from all over the world get in touch with me wanting interviews. I've declined because I don't want to be part of any information war. And I, also, I don't want to be the story. You know, I mean, I think that the real story here isn't me. It's the fact that, yes, that someone who had the temerity to question official government narratives is regarded as a threat to national security. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Oh, I know. This could, this, could, this, could, this could so easily apply to average citizens. I mean, in the in the UK, um, in 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 the lead up to this, in, in, sorry, in the lead up to the to the to, to the war in Ukraine, for for many years there there were think tanks, many of them you know state funded or quasi state funded, who were coming out with completely crazy. Um, proposals for dealing with the scourge of quote-unquote Russian disinformation. And SEPA, which is a West, I think they're based in the US, but they have strong UK links. They produced a report, I think it was in 2018, where they said that people who've been exposed to to, to RT and Sputnik will need to be... Um, to, to go to effectively re-education camps in the manner of returning uh, ISIS fighters because they will be their minds will be so warped that they won't be able to engage with society in a um, uh, in a normal way, and it's just like I mean, at yeah. the time, I, I, at the time, I thought, well, that's disturbing. But this is someone who's being paid to say this. But you know, now these people are being consulted and, and relied upon by governments to set policy and to dictate yeah. what's true and what isn't. Yeah, very, very scary. I want to get back to the idea that you you mentioned, because I didn't actually know this, and shame on me for not, but you said earlier that um, that the Brits were actually trying to to escalate the, the conflict and that they are now more kind of bellicose in Ukraine than the Biden administration is. What is their motivation for, I mean, I know everybody hates Putin. They want to get rid of him, but what, what is the, what, what is the underlying reason for that nihilistic policy? I just don't, I don't understand it, Kit. I, I mean, it's a very, it's a very complicated long story, but I do, I think that there is the Britain for a very long time has been, has been possessed of a visceral hatred and distrust of Russia. And I, I, I strongly suspect that a part of this was that they were the one that got away in terms of, I mean, you know, if you go back to the, to the, the start of the, the, the 20th century, um, Queen Victoria was called the grandmother of Europe for a reason. Um, every major European country had one of her relatives on its throne. And right. the um, uh, you know, Tsar Nicholas uh, looked exactly like the British king at the time. It's actually quite frightening. Um, <laughs> the, 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 if you look at f- uh, photos of him and, um, I think it's, yes, King George, they look like absolutely identical. Um, it's yeah, like as if they're twin brothers. And you know, the the Russian Revolution was was a a demonstration of how average people could overthrow um, uh, you know monopoly capitalism. And the the, the British have hated have hated them ever since. I mean, and there's also just the fact that you know Russia is it has an enormous amount of nat- na- natural resources, and you know the, the, it has been the dream of successive. Um, British governments to balkanize the country. Um, in you know, after World War One, um, this is a very little known um, historical uh, episode. The the British and the Americans invaded uh, Russia on the side of the, uh, the 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 white Russians in the in the Russian Civil War, 
and um, they had detailed plans for the carve up of Russia when they were done. And you know, it was like, well, you'll get. It's like when they cut up the cake in Godfather Two. You know, when they're cutting up the cake in Cuba, and it's like, well, you'll get the gambling here, and you get the, the brothels here. It's like, yeah, the, yeah. They, they, they all had their eyes on on Russia's resources, and and you know, Russia refused to back down, and um, then you know, and then refused to be part of the Western kind of you know, you know Anglo American dominated system for the best part of half a century after after World War Two. But then I think that also that the, 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 the you you see this in numerous kind of unguarded comments from British officials when they are when they're at elite kind of talking shops like Chatham House, which you know nobody ever pays attention to this, so they, they feel they kind of let their hair down. That they they are very open about the fact that they don't like the fact that Russia um, is uh, willing and able to pursue its own interests. Like, you know, the the so much of the world in servile to um, you know, American, but also British interests. Like, I mean, I reported recently on some leaked um, re- uh, recordings of these um, these Moldovan officials who thought that they were talking to two wealthy American investors who were very, very open about like the level of corruption in their country. But they were also saying things like, "Well, you've got to bear in mind that this place is basically run by the U.S. Uh, the, the, the U.S. ambassador." Yeah. Like he's our governor. Yes. He's our governor. Yeah. And so, you know, Russia's Russia, you know, for a period in the nineties, the US kind of had the West kind of had that with, you know, kind of drunk, um, uh, malleable Yeltsin, um, who was willing to roll over and let, you know, um Western bankers and financial interests um rape and pillage the country. Um when you know put, like Putin came to power, he was it was assumed that he would be the same, um, and indeed, he spent a significant portion of time, um, you know, trying to you know, be friendly with, you know, you know with with the West, um, and you know, even at one stage, outlined plans for Russia to join EU and, and NATO. I mean, this culminated in in two thousand and eight with um what was it 2007 it was a, and it was a speech that he that putin gave at the kind of the, the uh, munich security conference where he literally said yeah. like you know well you claim that nato is a defensive alliance well it, it, who are you defending yourself from we we do not want to be your enemies yeah um and uh yeah, but you you will make an enemy of us if 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 you you know continue to lock us out and treat us like a pariah and i think that that you can kind of start the clock ticking really on the war in ukraine there I mean, that had already been a, been an issue that was talked about in the 90s in internal foreign office files, where yeah. where the, the, the British felt that this was likely to this was this, the, the, it was likely to lead to conflict unless issues around historic um, Russian and um, areas of, of of South and Eastern Ukraine um, were you know, either returned to Russia or there was some kind of political settlement. And, you know, and then also, what's her name? Who is the State Department chick that was caught on tape also in Ukraine? Oh, oh, oh Victoria Newland. Victoria, I mean, it's the same thing, right? They, 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 they are kind of running, running the show. But I, I just to use a very, very casual vernacular, the older I get and the more geopolitical catastrophes I see that happen over and over again. A war started ostensibly for good reasons, based on a lie. They go in, it's a disaster, and everybody suffers, right? When are they going to learn? I mean, they, I, 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 there's no other word to use about people who think that way than psycho. I mean, they have to be they, they, they have to be psychopaths to think that this is not going to end badly for everybody if they continue to pursue these misbegotten military things. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking that they continue over and over to do it, expecting a different result, and it never works out the way it's supposed to. I just don't understand it. There's something wrong with the West, Right. Um, that's quite a broad question, um, but yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I do. Th- I mean, I, th- I think that one of the one of the key things as well is that uh, you, know, to, you know to bear in mind is that I think that the the U.S. empire has been kind of collapsing for quite a long time. Yeah. And it, 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 this is becoming turbocharged now, you know, like rapidly, then oh, sorry, gradually, then rapidly. And yeah. Britain, since um, World War Two, or at least, I mean, in World War Two as well has heavily depended on U.S. primacy in order to remain relevant 
Um, and, you know, as such, all of its thinking, well, the vast bulk of its thinking, domestic and foreign, is about trying to preserve US dominion, like, over the entire world. And, uh, you know, a component of this is going around the world starting fires in the hope that the US will extinguish the blaze or pour more petrol on it, depending on what yeah. Britain's interests are. So they have a vested interest in, in, in keeping this going because, you know, obviously being a small island with, uh, you know, it, it no longer has, you know, a military worth speaking of really um uh, and you know it's 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 primary export is cultural um you know it, it, because of the the um uh, universality of the english of the english language um it, it's yeah. already sliding rapidly into poverty and irrelevance and so i think that they're going to continue they will continue continue trying to do this but again it, it's kind of, it's it's swimming again it's swimming against the current and and the, i i also think that the us in its own way has has um a similar kind of thinking in just the sense of well oh. we are losing we are losing our influence and, and and power over much of the world but we remain yeah. th- we remain uncontested within within europe and and north america therefore that needs to be our you know our kind of area of focus and and also there is a sense of well you know, as um, living standards decline and as our you know international relevant relevance declines, the, the way that, the way to counter counteract this is just to propagandize people even harder. And I, yeah, the, the the I mean, you know, I, I have a great many American friends. I love them dearly. Um, some of the more kind of uh, uh, patri- uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the more, the more patriotic among them, who um, you know might even make you know arguments in favour of, of of US foreign policy, with, with which I dis- disagree, and and felt and felt you know not long ago that the US was the freest country in the world. They are tripping over themselves trying to get out now. Uh, you know, yeah. they, are, they, yeah. are, they, they can barely survive, and we have we. I mean, in a very a, a very uh, blatant and um, uh, what's the word um, uh, amateurish um, attempt to manipulate people. The Biden administration has not only. Re- redefined what a recession is in order to claim the U.S. <laughs> yes, it also, yes. It also revealed that the U.S. Treasury was not c- counting the cost of food or energy or rent in inflation calculations. And it's like this is know, how, how we you gauge inflation. So I think it's there is a sense of well, if if, if if nothing else, we can still try and manipulate people into you know um, into thinking that everything is okay when you know it paid to me isn't and it's getting increasingly less okay with every day so yeah. I, you know there is a, there is an ele- a, an emperor's new clothes aspect to all this i thought that's so well said kit because I, I mean i say on this show i believe america's a failed state a failing state if not a failed state uh, because what happens when you don't have an objective working news media media has always been somewhat you know, off. But but when you don't have a, a news media that's at least attempting to hold, um, you know, leadership to account, then they, and they realize that now they know they don't have to tell the truth. They know they can do whatever they want and that the media that the public is just going to be propagandized and nobody's going to call them out. I mean, Biden as president, really? I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's absurd. It's it's actually absurd when you look at it. So so let me ask you this. Um because I didn't and I should, who do you think is behind what happened to you at the airport and what is their goal? Well, I mean, I, I have I have a bunch of suspicions. I mean, I, I, Max obviously speculated that there could have that um, uh, Paul Mason, uh, the, the uh, British journalist slash um, uh, intelligence asset um, that, that could have been behind this. I mean, I'm less convinced by that, but what I'm certain of is that the fact that, that you know I mentioned you know spooks spooking themselves. I think that a lot, a, 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 there is a. Um, constituency within the intelligence services who see Russia under every bed 
um, and always have done and are therefore convinced that the grey zone is, you know, run by the KGB, um, and th- th- they have, uh, they are probably encouraged by this, um, iterate in this by a large number of you know, counter disinformation specialists, you know, many of whom themselves are former quote unquote intelligence operatives or have you know, kind of been adjacent to them um, as part of their, you know, as part of government work in the past, so, um, who have all sorts of crazy ideas about how quote unquote disinformation works. So. To give you an example, there was this guy called Amil Khan, who for many years um, re- w- effectively ran um, information warfare operations for British intelligence in the, during the Syrian Dirty War. Now, this included creating fake citizen journalist um, collectives that would um, you know, uh, perpetuate pro-regime change propaganda for domestic and foreign audiences, you know, training you know, the opposition uh, to give interviews to the Western media um, uh, uh, you know, and also, yes, that kind of uh, soften and whitewash the, the murderous image of the Free Syrian Army and all of the, the uh, head-chopping jihadist groups that Britain and London were funding to get rid of Assad. We see how that's worked out. But the, but yes, the, in effect, the, the, he is now a yes a disinformation specialist. And now I've I've um, uh, I have some of his company's reports in my possession, which specifically refer to me in the grey zone. I mean, and they are completely batshit. Like, and there's this, there was this one particularly <laughs> amazing, a particularly amazing passage where he took. The, I I posted about um, Am, about Amil Khan and his company. It's called Valent Project, and uh, I, I mentioned his his government background and some of the kind of more modern work he's been involved in. Psyop. He was involved in uh, running a bread tube personality as as a as a, a front person for a for a pro vaccination campaign in the UK. And um, it, it, in in this report, it claims that I that the, the content I posted indicated that I either work for or have links to um, the Russian security services. All of the information I included in these tweets was taken from Google. Um, you know, and like, there's all, it, it, you know, we see this in, he wow. was, he was conspiring, Amal Khan was conspiring to take down the gray zone with, with Paul Mason. And they both had, yes, completely zany, uh, takes on, on, on our organization and how we operate. And then I think that, you know, at one stage, Paul Mason said that he wanted to find out what our deliverables were for Russian and Chinese spying spying agencies. Um, And I was specifically asked whether I had any deliverables um, in my in my in, in my police interviews, so I mean, yeah, I mean whether Mason got that from his handlers in British intelligence or whether he they got that from him, I'm not sure. But I, yes, I, I do think that someone clearly fed one way or another a large amount of conspiracy theorist drivel um, you know, uh, to British security services, and they they acted upon that information. Um, yeah, and this is not a small thing. I mean, I, I interviewed um, Jacob Siegel, who wrote this brilliant piece on um, for the uh, Columbia, uh, no, for Tablet Magazine. Sorry, about the media playing into the Russia hoax and how all of that went down. And he talked about Hamilton sixty eight and Bellingcat and all of these kind of peripheral. You know, they're kind of quasi journalistic, but they're actually very spooky. And and is that sort of the world that now has maybe trained its guns on you, do you think? Is it that bunch of people who are saying they're something, but they're very likely actually something else? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, yeah, as I was... Yeah, as, I, as I was going, um, as, 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 as I was answering the last question, it dawned on me that yes, that um, you know, Paul Mason in his uh, in his in his internal emails with Khan was talking about how um, uh, well, you know, we 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 the steady flow of of, of, in, of intel agency input by proxy, a la Bellingcat. Um, although he saw it as a good thing in their in their case, so yes, there is this assumption that well, you know, we the the, the, the well, if if Western organisations operate in this, or Western funded or backed organisations operate in this manner, then clearly, you know, opposite, you know, opposition media must must do as well. I mean, you know, I, I think that 
the, the, the as I think I mentioned, but uh, but yeah, they, they they were very keen to know about 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 Grey Zones funding. They were very keen to um, uh, the, the the terror officers. I mean, they were very very keen to find out how much I was paid, how often I was paid, to what wow. bank account, the bank account oh. details where I received this money, and like and also stuff. You know, do you own any foreign property? Do you have any investments anywhere? And all this other stuff. So I mean, that's probably being gone over with, with a fine tooth comb right now. Um, as well, and it's just like I mean, it's just comp- it's 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 completely crazy. And I, and I also I I think that you know in terms of in terms of wide relevance beyond journalism, I think that the it's very clear that they view any any and all opposition voices as somehow one way or another, whether wittingly or not, um, you, you know, directed by um, uh, hostile foreign actors. This is creating a really really dangerous situation whereby anyone expressing anti-war anti-imperial positions is going to at the very least be deplatformed and censored but yeah. yes it's going to be yeah. it's going to it's going to going to be harassed and um uh surveilled and and had the have the you know in, 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 most intimate aspects of their life probed heavily i mean this it, it, i recently reported for um uh min press i it, 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 yeah, I, meant, yeah, I mentioned earlier how they weren't really interested in any other publication apart from gray zone um one of the officers said oh i've never heard of min press zone um which is not its name <laughs> um so quite clearly they hadn't done any due diligence into this at all yeah but the i reported on that there's a a very uh, shady organization called data miner which is a it's effectively a social media spying tool which is has been used by spying agencies and has um you know former uh for a number of former cia and mi6 officials at, you, know, or, you know within its ranks and um it you know very oddly individuals connected to the, there were there were several individuals connected to this organ to, to data miner who signed that letter for Politico stating that the New York Post's Hunter Biden laptop reporting was Russian disinformation. Now, yes. I speculate, although I think it's, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't think it's a leap of logic at all, that the, 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 the NY Post reporting suppression on Twitter was just one component of a much wider effort to monitor and um, uh, identify people who are raising questions about um, the, you know, the Biden family's finances and um, you know, online. And you know, that would, bear in mind the data miner has contracts with uh, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security to monitor yeah. um, you know, Black Lives Matter and also you know, other kind of campaign groups. The idea it wouldn't be turned against anyone you, you just you know, out of even curiosity talking about the, you know, the, 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 the contents of Hunter's laptop is kind of farcical, actually. So I, yeah, I strongly suspect that the, 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 the Twitter moving to ban sharing of the story online was just that it was kind of tip of the iceberg. And actually, there was a lot more happening behind the scenes that was considerably more sinister. Yeah, well, as somebody who's been swimming around in COVID for, three, you know, I mean, yeah. what Twitter did mostly to the COVID heretics who ended up being correct about most things mm. was at the direct of the direction of powerful people in the medical establishment who wanted it. So what, you know, of course that stuff is going on. What I kind of don't get about what happened to you is, is the idea that do these, you, you said whether wittingly or not, which was such a good phrase because do they actually think there's a possibility that Putin's telling you what to write or, or are they using this as a way to intimidate you about what you write? Which is it, do you think, based on your encounter with them? I mean, I think it's I, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, I think that yeah, there there is this kind of there is this sense now, and this is I mean they they're, they're quite clear they they are quite clearly moved to almost enshrine this in law that it, you know that were the terrifying that if you. And this was quite clear from Paul Mason's emails as well. But if you express a dissenting opinion, it's either because you are, you know, a paid propagandist who's being fed talking points and pre-agreed lines, um, or you've unwittingly been uh, propagandized and therefore are in need of a brain realignment. Um, courtesy of the CIA <laughs> and MI6, but the but also yeah. but 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 yes, I I I, I mean, and intimidation was quite clearly you know like the um, you know, the order of the day, and I, I and I also think there was a, there was a sense of 
the, the, it would have been calculated that that I would have at the very least, you know, a, probably approached um, a lawyer and or a pr- press rights organisation about you know what happened to me, and you know that's it becoming public. Yes, there's an enormous amount of support and outcry, but I do think that it, there is a chilling effect as well. And this is oh yes, this is, I mean, yes, you can yes. see it with with Julian Assange. Like there is literally <laughs> no it, 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 on any basis there is zero reason for him to be in jail still. Like, not least because yeah. WikiLeaks doesn't exist. Like, you know, it, 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 it's destroyed now. Like, it, 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 as an organization, you know, and it's, you know, it, 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 can, it cannot function. It, you know, it's uh, a sorted operative now, now do other do you- things. And I think that, yes, that the there are, I, I know for a fact that there are, you know, independent journalists who there are stuff they won't go near because already, yep. because I mean, I some of the stuff that I've reported on people, I've had some people who who I have you know the utmost respect for tell me like, well, you're braver than me, pal. Um, and I do think, and I think that this, the, 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 yeah, yeah, my my experience is going to result in a lot more people being even more cautious and, um, you know, for want of a better word, you know, frightened of the, the potential repercussions for, um, you know, reporting on sensitive issues. Well, you know what, what's going on too, um, and I, I do want you to talk about this a little bit, was the idea that I think it was this Paul Mason person who was saying, let we've got to get gray zone deplatformed, which is a threat that hangs over everybody. But the other thing that's quite real, speaking to you from the country in which a legitimate protest by the trucking, the truckers convoy against vaccine mandates uh, a- ended because our one of our ministers, Christian Freeland, froze everybody's bank accounts. And this is the other scary part of this now, that if PayPal doesn't like you or Patreon gets an instruction or somebody who runs a funding platform, uh, GoFundMe was the other one, that they just grabbed the millions of dollars that people had donated to the truckers. This is the other thing, the other sword of Damocles hanging over indie media, right? It's not courage. There's lots of courage. It's not access. We can get it, but it's being shut down financially at the drop of a hat and not being able to find a way out. And I fear that that's next. Do you, do you think about that? Oh, yeah. oh yes. I mean, I, I, that, that is another, that is another, you know, fear that weighs in my mind is that, you know, the, the, um, the, the threat of asset seizure or, you know, like kind of sanctions of some kind, because I mean, there, there is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but the, you know, there's a British vlogger um, called uh, uh, Graham Phillips, who he um, kind of gained notoriety or some kind of degree of prominence by traveling to uh, the Donbass while the civil war was going on. And, um, you know, he, uh, you know, covering events from the perspectives of the, of the, um, the Donetsk and Luhansk um, people's republics. And uh, the, he traveled again to Ukraine when, when the, uh, following the invasion. Uh, and he, uh, in, I mean, I, I think that he did the wrong thing. Um, but like he, he interviewed Ukrainian prisoners of war on camera, which is by some estimates is a, you know, a break, a breach of the Geneva convention. I mean, but, but he, he the the British government sanctioned him, which is the only time in history that a government has sanctioned one of its own citizens. And they took his home, they took <gasps> bank accounts, they took all of his property and all of his what? money. Money and and what's more, they did this despite the fact that, according to, it, 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 there are some. In, I think it was by FOI that there were some internal discussions that were unearthed. They did this despite knowing it was completely illegal. That they had no legal basis for doing, yes. and I think that yeah, the, 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 yes. in the in the kind of anti-Russian hysteria of the present day, I think that I mean the British government has passed laws which um, you know, make uh, uh, make make it a criminal offence to. Um, uh, to uh, the, 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 assisting Russia's information war or something, which is again very broad. It's like a criminal offence and all this other stuff. And it's just like you know that yeah, the, 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 the if if it, it, the, the, the fact that they could do this and do this without you know without compunction. I mean, it doesn't give me much hope that the, you know the kind of rule of law um, <laughs> you know, would, would would save me from. Um, uh, from you know, you know from excessive punishment like that um and but yeah it's just like it, 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 it it's quite it's quite and there was virtually you know no pushback on this whatsoever uh from from, from anyone apart i mean i think Chris, uh, sorry peter hitchens stood a, stood a, stood apart um and you know by um oh did he 
Yeah, oh. he, st- he stood up for Graham Phillips and said, I, I dislike his views, but what they're doing is shocking, which is kind of, you know, that, would, that I, I, I'm in that category. But it's like, the, it, 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 I, I think as well that, that you know, what's even more horrifying is there is a, um, uh, that there, that, that it's called the National Security Bill. And this is a new bit of legislation, which is very close to being passed in the UK. And it could mean life imprisonment for uh, possessing classified information. And it's like there's all sorts of crazy um, uh, passages in it, which is just like, you know, it's the kind of thing that we're told North Korea does in terms of, you know, it, it just, it's just it's, it's right. vicious, brutal repression and punishment of, of whistleblowers and leakers and publishers and journalists. And I might add that it has, again, this has received zero critical attention or comment in mainstream media. I think that is a reflection, not only of the fact that the media in the, in, in the UK is just very bad, like it's very, it's just very bad at reporting what's actually going on. But also, it's because yeah. this doesn't threaten them at all. Like the, yeah. <laughs> this is because they yeah. don't actually do serious journalism on national security. Yeah, no, I mean, unless, well, I guess the, the everybody's focused on Philip Schofield right now, and that's kind of twenty four seven wall to wall, right? I mean, that's that's and Harry and Meghan who are, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't like them either, but. Uh, there's lots more important things going on in the world right now. Um, I, I think it's really interesting what you just said because there is a story in America about this young slash whistleblower marine type kid who had some classified documents he was putting up on Twitch or one of these platforms. I don't understand because I don't game, but yeah, and 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 it was Bellingcat actually who helped lead the the New York Post or the Washington Post and the New York Times, who in turn helped lead the FBI to arrest this guy. And I thought, wow, like this is the total opposite of what should be happening regardless of what you think what this kid did because the precedent, you know, the Pentagon paper, that wouldn't happen today. I, I just don't think it would. I mean, you're a whistleblower if your whistleblowing supports the narrative. And if your whistleblowing doesn't support the narrative, then you're a criminal. And it's that's and the media agrees with that. It's really scary. Oh yeah, and so I mean, I actually, I, I, it's it's funny. I think due to films like All the President's Men, and, and what's what's that one with Russell Crowe about smoking? Is it called The Company? Yeah, um, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it was the, about Jeffrey Wigand, the yeah. guy who blew the whistle on the on the smoke the smoking documents, and also Spotlight too, which is a great. Oh, film that is, I mean, that's that's a really that's a really good film. I, I love yeah, I loved it. it. But the, yeah. I think that that basically that the. the um, I was going to say, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the 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 trope of of heroic whistleblower who blows the lid off of of conspiracies um, is it, it's it's very romantic, and and I think that there's you know whenever we see whistleblowers in the media, um, they, it, they 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 they're usually um, presented in those terms um but you know so for instance we look at say like reality winner or like christopher wiley um but then people who actually like actual whistleblowers who actually expose malfeasance and and um you know actually make a significant difference they have miserable lives like i know this yeah. guy who um is, is called nicholas wilson who he exposed a multi-billion fraud by hsbc which is a you know basically a, a, a criminal british bank and they i mean he has, <laughs> he has this theory called one degree of separation where if you look at like any scandal in the world like hsbc is somehow involved and it's it literally what <laughs> it literally works but the but yeah the, in effect that like he he fought this bruising campaign against hsbc and britain's financial regulators in order to um uh, you know, alert the public and get them compensation and redress for this fraud. I mean, this was like, you know, average consumers were affected by this and it ruined his life. And, you know, yeah. and, and he has received no support from the media or, you know, any rights groups or anything. Um, you know, he is a truly inspirational person and I, I, I mean, he's very, very ill at the moment, sadly. But, oh, but, yes, but, but, but if you look at like reality winner, I mean, again, I strongly disagree with her going to prison at all, let alone for the, you know, I think, what was it, like four and a half years or something that she got? It was yeah. really crazy. But, the, uh, yeah. but like she, what she leaked was rubbish. But, and I strongly suspect was a um, plot was it, it was a planted um, leak from the CIA. I mean, it was a bit. It was a document which claimed, on the basis of it, of an of an unsupported analyst judgment, that Russia might have been uh, behind a spear phishing attempt in order to um, 
basically it's attempted to spearfish um, U.S. election offices. But, the, you know, the, this this was built yeah. up in the media as proof of, like, the Kremlin has hacked into our voting systems. Um, yeah. It wasn't that. And then cut, for, cut to, you know, when she's released, she's doing interviews with 60 Minutes uh, saying that, you know, I felt somebody had to make a stand and, like, all this other stuff. It's just like, I mean, she's clearly not very intelligent either. Like, she used her work computer at the NSA to email the internet. <laughs> Um, and also, she yeah. also as well. She worked with the Intercept in the first place, which has a history of burning its sources and getting them jailed. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah. it's like you know, the, when people are held up on that, and, and yes, championed as, as heroic whistleblowers, they never really are. And the truly heroic whistleblowers, you never hear about. Yeah, well, that's abs- it's a thousand percent true. There was a whistleblower on the uh, Pfizer vaccine as well, who I interviewed and who was written about in the British Medical Journal who was not picked up by legacy media at all because all they could do for two years was chant safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. Mm. And regardless of anybody's position on a vaccine, no vaccine is perfectly safe. No vaccine is perfectly effective, but any discussion of any gradation of criticism of the vaccine was verboten. So when she, and she had audio tapes and documents. I mean, nobody was interested. The BMJ did it. So, you know, God bless them for doing it. But, um, not interested in the story because for some, I think it was because of the trusted news initiative that CBC was part of that, that they decided that they were not going to criticize the vaccine. And and you'll recall, or, or maybe not, but in some of the Twitter files reporting that Matt Taibbi and My- Michael Schellenberger did, uh, they found through Stanford University, which is a hotbed of censorship that, um, that Twitter was censoring and being asked to censor vaccine information that was true if it criticized the vaccine. So you couldn't even say something true, bad about the vaccine. They were censoring it because it might cause vaccine hesitation. And then, of course, the question is, well, if the vaccine is causing problems, people should be hesitant. <laughs> like it, just like this weird, weird sort of thing. So that stuff was not being picked up by legacy media and probably won't be for a very, very long time. It's, um, you use the phrase dissonance and I, I agree with you. It's very, very tough to be somebody working in the information space right now because everything is so corrupt. It's just nuts. I just want to say one thing about, um, about WikiLeaks too. And it was a sad day. I had foolishly bookmarked a very, very important document in their vault seven file. And I'm not going to reveal what it was because I'm hoping one day I might get it. And if you know anybody who has access to the WikiLeaks files somewhere in a computer, let me know. But And I I bookmarked it. I didn't print it off. And I went back to get it to use it in a story. And the link was dead. And all the Vault 7 stuff was gone. Indeed, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I, 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 I could probably hook you up with that material. Um, I mean, good. I, I, <laughs> this is maybe not the kind of thing I like to show off about given the present circumstances. But yes, I mean, yeah. I, I do. I, yeah, but I think that also as well that there, there really is, as I mentioned, and I kind of alluded to earlier, there is a, um, a, you know, what would you do when the devil turns around on you type, type aspect of all this. And it's like, you can never actually be, um, establishment enough, like in your view, it, like yeah. in your view, and then yeah. you know we see this on a on a, a micro level. We also see it on a, on a um uh, on on a political level overseas. There are a number of governments, like particularly in my neck, of, my kind of adopted neck of the woods, like near Serbia, who which have you know, um, undertaken kind of counter Russian measures since the invasion, whether that's adopting sanctions or whether that's um, condemning the invasion at the UN, um, et cetera. And, um, you know, some of, some of which have been added to Moscow's um, enemies list. Um, and they are still axiomatically referred to as pro-Russian in, <laughs> in, in the mainstream media. And it's just like, yeah. at what, you know, it, it, you're never ever going to be sufficiently anti-Russian in order to pass the, the uh, yes, the Russian disinformation test. And it's like, it just gets to the point that there will come a time when you're you, you, even, perhaps even the most rabidly pro-Ukrainian uh, people who have gotten, you know, the Ukrainian flag um, tattooed on, the, on them will, will <laughs> find that, that, you know, that's not enough. Or alternatively, suddenly this will bec- become verboten because um, Ukraine will have been thrown under the bus. And, you know, I think that, that we will see 
an almost like a shoal of fish moving as one. I think we will see a kind of mass bonfire of Ukrainian flags from people's Twitter profiles. And, not, oh, and then everyone, I, I will, everyone yeah. will just pretend it never happened. But it's, I think that, yes, that this is, and again, this is, I think, something that, you know, people are people are increasingly recognizing that it, yes, it, it is very, it is it, very, very dangerous to allow um, you know governments and powerful organizations the power to dictate. Well, this is disinformation, and this isn't. Oh. I mean, I, I've even I never I will never tire ever tire of, of repeating this. But I mean, this is a verbatim quote from a um, an, an internal Foreign Office document related to a British intelligence operation to counter fake news, um, and it states. Uh, One of the key problems of countering Russian disinformation is that it's often factually true and uh, responding to inconvenient truths is problematic. And it's like, yeah, you know, it it, it has been, yes, the past year, I think, has been a crash course for a lot of of people in what the limits of permissible speech are. And also, yes, like kind of soft, you know, soft censorship, soft propaganda of of, of, just silencing or maligning or ignoring particular particular viewpoints. Very, very difficult time. So let me ask you this as we move to close here. Kit, thank you very much for doing this, by the way. I'm super, so very, very grateful. And I'm so sorry it happened. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're unsettled. I would be. I, I would feel whatever they implanted in your head to cause you anxiety probably is working. I, I would feel that way. And I'm even feeling a little bit because I'm interviewing you. So let me just say it. No, I'm not actually scared <laughs> or even anxious, but but one does. They th- This is how they do the job, isn't it? They make a fuss and then everybody's like, uh, am I next? You know, and I'm not important enough to be next, but you know what I'm saying? It implants a little bit of, of anxiety, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, again, I worry about next steps. I wonder if you know there's there's more more to come. I'm I am of course worried about the the, uh, the prospect of, of it, you know some smear campaign being leveled against me or indeed the, yeah. you know, my my uh, my dear friends and colleagues at the grey zone. Um, you know, I think that you know uh, Max and Aaron have extremely thick skins by this point. So I'm not I'm not yeah. I'm not you know, I mean as do I. Like, I'm not particularly concerned about some NAFO moron saying that like oh we're Vatnik proper propaganda blah you know i don't care about that but i think yeah. you know the, the attempts to destroy people's reputation um you know that is that's a you know recurring theme when the the, the intelligence services go after people and we see well the defunding right the defunding oh, is yeah. what oh, yeah. scares me. oh yeah, yeah. it's like and i think that yes that also as well yes just you know um you know, cutting off our access to finance i mean you know the, the, one of the most rem- you know you mentioned you had people from consortium news on you know they had their paypal um yes. cut down summarily without any explanation funnily enough they crop up in emails between paul mason and his british intelligence handler um they are um yes they, they are it, 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 you know and that is a, a yes a, a way of, of crippling these organizations i mean another thing i might add as well is that you know that the, the if you think that think that consortium consortium news is a um Russian propaganda outfit. You might think that the Russians would pour more money into it. I think they only had about ten <laughs> grand yeah. or something in their in their PayPal, and it's just like you know, it, know. It, it's it, it, yeah. These places run on a shoestring, and they 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 desperately need your support. And indeed, the, the mechanisms by which people can support them are contracting all the time. You know, I have a sub. I have a Substack. Um, you know, my again, since my uh, uh, since my uh, the the, the, the my detention was publicized. I have gotten hundreds of new paying subscribers, <laughs> which Good. I'm, you know, Good. thrilled, you know, thrilled and extremely flattered and grateful for. Um, but you know, what the, will will the time come when I get booted off that? I don't know. Yeah. No, no, I don't think Substack. I, you know, and just so people know, Kit Clarenberg, and uh, is that what your Substack called? Does it have a name, or is it just you? It's just Kit Clarenberg. Substack.com. Okay, I'm not worried about Substack. They're pretty. They're pretty solid. But, uh, you know, maybe Stripe. Stripe is the people who deliver the coin to us from Substack, right? So who knows? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just that that's the scary part of all of this. So so you have a lawyer paid for by you or is somebody helping you with that? Or are you going to fund it? It's, it, it, it's, it's out of my own pocket, but that is, that is um, uh, it, 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 they are – 
being very generous and, and helping me by and large pro bono. But I mean, it would if 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 the crunch came, I would yes have to stump up costs myself. Well, let us know about that, and we'll do what we can to help you fundraise. And then the other thing I just want to ask you about in reading the background uh, documents on this from Gray Zone, um, it, w- it was there a plan from either this Paul Mason dude or someone else to actually do a dirty tricks on Gray Zone? At some point, were they talking about trying to find a way to to remove their credibility? Am I right in reading that? Oh yeah, they were talking about yes, it was a. Oh, I feel irritating there. I forget the phrasing now, but it was like a kind of. I think they, they talked about a uh, uh, a John Stewart type sting yes, operation yes. of like, and 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 which makes us which makes us look ridiculous. And they they, they specifically cited there was an example, quite a remarkable um, uh, case a few years ago where there was this there was this academic called Paul McKeague who he was part of a um, academic collective that was looking at propaganda and information warfare. Yeah, I, I know him personally, he's a very good researcher, but they were looking into this organization called the, the Center for International Justice, uh, which is run by, you know, kind of dodgy Intel-linked actors, and uh, including a guy called Bill Wiley, who um, seems to be a former CIA, former "quote unquote" CIA operative, who was involved. <laughs> it was involved in effectively, you know, trying to bring war crimes charges against Syrian government officials. And they noted, um, it effectively, sorry, that he, when when uh, the when the centre found out McKeague was looking into them, they started emailing him on, uh, and, and uh, but, but under a pseudonym and providing him with kind of information um, and uh, on the centre. But it was a limited hangout in order to find out what he knew and also to like throw him off the scent in his in, in his investigation. This is exactly yeah. what the CIA or FBI would do um interestingly and then he was he was publicly outed and and various exchanges he had were taken out of context to make it seem like he was a russian spy and that sort of thing and they they cited that as an example to follow with us but like you know i mean it's it it, 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 this is is another thing as well is and my my dear friend aaron mate has made this point many times but um the, the what's really interesting in the in the um uh, in these communications, and I think this speaks to a wider um, uh, kind of perspective on this, on you know, the British or Western deep state, is that they come up with all of these schemes to try and undermine us, or like just to try and get us deplatformed, or like, oh well, you know, if we could get Russian state media added to their Twitter profiles, that'll damage their reach, and no one will be able to see them. Like Aaron has, you know, very impassionately asked, why would you not write a rebuttal? Why would yeah. you actually debate us? And it's like, the, the, yes. they, even, they even stay in their, um, it, it, I think Paul Mason states in one of his emails, that he's really worried about the emergence of an anti-imperial um, left movement because liberalism will have no response to it. And it's like, well, yeah, because like, like, we're right and you're wrong. But, you know, it's just it, it, yeah. it's literally that there is, that, yeah, liberalism has no responses to actually anything, particularly not the current crisis. But like, you know, when... Um, yes, the, 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 lib, the liberal, the liberal reading of the war. That yes, this is a this is all about you know democracy and freedom versus yes, like tyranny and Nazi style fascism. And it's just like it, 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 in that context when you point out, oh well, actually, you know, this is just not true. Their only response is to censor and silence and to try and yes, destroy destroy you and discredit you through malign connivances it's quite remarkable and it's like yeah that you know i mean i like baron have frequently invited our detractors and critics to debate us it is vanishingly rare that they ever ever take up the um, the offer that- well i i would i'd look at that's that is the playbook and i would say that the, the you know some of the <clears throat> some of the COVID doctors who were asking for focused protection instead of lockdowns, you know, and they had a reason to suggest it based on numbers and data, couldn't get debated either. The attacks on them were all ad hominem. They tried to, you know, really get Sunetra Gupta, who is a Brit for, at Oxford, and they, you know, I mean, that's what they do. And women feel the same when we tried to debate whether, you know, people who identify as women should be allowed in our spaces. We can't have the debate. We're just transphobes and, and turfs. And that's what that that is absolutely the playbook. I mean, if 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 the ideas that we're saying over here in the independent media are so terrible, then debate us, and we'll see mm. who wins. Right there, there actually was a monk debate like that with um, 
oh, I shouldn't have brought it up because I can't remember who it was, but they, but the clock was cleaned by the people on our side mm. uh, because they, uh, you know, they, 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 they don't bring data. They don't bring mm. arguments. They're, they're Not dealing biased. from some place of emotion and, and virtue signaling. And yeah, like it's, it's madness. And that's why they have to get together to be quiet, to make us be quiet because they have to use the jackboot. They cannot use an argument. That's what's yeah. really going on here, right? And that, and, and as legacy media flails and dies, they're ramping up the oh, this is they're you know they're attacking us and they're being mean to our journalists and their disinformation. And now we're countering. We have people who are going to counter what they're saying. I mean, it's insane. It's we are living through a very very bad time right now. But you're going to be okay, right? Is that right, Kip? I mean, yes, with any luck. I mean, I might be, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I might be dining with Julian Assange, um, like, you know, <laughs> this time next week. But I, I mean, I, I sincerely, I sincerely hope not. Um, and when I'm sincerely hope that, that, that Julian is, is freed and reunited with his beautiful family. But the, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be okay. You know, I, as I say, I have a thick skin and I have a history of standing up to bullies. So if they want trouble, they can have it. Um, and, you know, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going. You know, I, as I say, I'm greatly reassured that by, you know, the the, the, the outpouring of, 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 of support for me from, you know, and, and often quite unexpected places and people um, yeah. you know, that like and I, 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 <clears throat> if it was the case that. Uh, you know, I was to end up in, in, in jail over this over some 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 nonsense. I mean, I think that, that there are, there are other people who will continue the fight. Hey, we'll come and bust you all out. We'll yeah. come and get you, Julian. We'll do some kind of an operation. <laughs> get you guys out. <laughs> an international operation by indie journalists going over to Belmarsh and getting everybody out. That's my big regret about, I had many regrets about Trump, but the one I thought he would pardon Julian and, and mm. I, I thought he would. I thought he would. Yeah. And yeah, he, yeah, bad news. Anyway, look, at, thanks for doing this. What an interesting story and what a brave guy you are. And uh, keep on going. I didn't ask you this because we didn't talk about some of the stories like the Buka story and all of that that mm. made them so angry at you. But will there, you, you think things will just collapse in, in Ukraine? Just give me your, your short answer on it. Will it be peace talks? done secretly that resolve this in the end or will it actually be just a complete collapse since they're far down that road now anyway well i mean i think that the the because because collapse seems you know all but inevitable in the very near future i do think because the u.s wants to recoup something on its investment and ensure that there's you know something of ukraine left um you know i mean at least to exploit um, yeah left to, ex- left to exploit and, and you know a kind yeah. of skeleton population in order to exploit it on their behalf <laughs> I, you know, I, I do think that the U.S. will pull back. Will pull back, and I mean, one, uh, and indeed, I, I strongly suspect that a negotiated settlement will actually probably result in the U.S. compelling the, U- the Ukraine to hand over um, uh, territory like Odessa and Kharkiv. Um, the, that RAN report I mentioned explicitly said there was very little value in defending Ukrainian territorial integrity. I mean, I, I yeah. do, a, a, an analogy I would use as a closer is that in the, Bo- the Bosnian War. <laughs> Which I've written about. Um, it was, it, you know, that was a conflict that was aggressively encouraged by the U.S. You know, there were numerous attempts to um, create, a, to forge a political settlement to prevent um, bloodshed, uh, which were very generous to all sides. Um, and the um, Slavic Muslim leadership, as it was, they, they're now known as Bosniaks, but they refused because, due to the U.S. saying, "Well, we've got your back no matter what. You have unconditional financial and military backing from us." And they were also encouraged to not engage in peace talks with the Yugoslavs or the Serbs. And um, they that meant that the conflict ground on for three years and, you know, by causing 100,000 deaths by some, you know, many of them civilians by some, uh, by some estimation. Um, when it came time, when the US got bored of this, decided it, want, it didn't want it to go on anymore, they forced the Slavic Muslims into a peace deal that was worse than every single offer that had been put to them by the Serbs and the Yugoslavs before that. And they said, if you don't accept this, then we're going to pull out the rug from under you. And yeah. now that Ukraine is completely dependent on the US to support to keep its lights on and to like, you know, yeah. for people to feed themselves, uh, you know, they're having like mass, there's serious inflation problems and all sorts of other things. You know, the cost of living is skyrocketing in Ukraine. Um, the, they, uh, yeah, that like, it, when the U.S. tires of this and decides to focus on Taiwan, 
the Kiev will have no choice but to accept whatever the U.S. puts in front of them. Uh, so and Zelensky I, will have a villa in either Miami oh, or yeah. Croatia, right? Oh, That's <laughs> well, yes, no, I, I, mean, I, I, I think I think it will likely be Miami, um, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, and I, I think that I, I, another thing, just just very quickly, I will say is that I think that one of the ways this 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 could be sold to, to Ukraine is via a even if informal Polish Ukraine union, because this could be sold as well. Well, you kind of get EU and NATO membership by the back door, kind of. And also, yeah. like, you know, you, um, uh, I mean, already, you know, the, the border between Ukraine and Poland doesn't really exist anymore. And this is like openly stated, like, you know, it's you freedom of movement between the two. Um, and so I think it, it would also be a, a way of ensuring that, the, you know, that, that there is not a, a total population collapse in Ukraine, just a, a large minor one. But the, and I, yeah, the, and I think from that perspective, that, you know, that that's kind of attractive and can be solved as some kind of political or even military win. Um, when it's nothing of the kind. Yeah, what a shame. I mean, Trump was right about NATO too. I hate to say it, but I mean, wow, it's just what a what a disaster. And all well, the one thing I think about knowing the little bit I do about war, I wrote a book about the Iraq War, is what is left behind. I'm assuming there are lots of amputations and mm. crush injuries and and uh, households where the breadwinner is dead. I mean, and no one, of course, is talking about that. They never do. But I, you know, it must be a humanitarian crisis in many places in that country now, is it not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, again, just you know, what my neck of the woods in Serbia, the, um, the, the, the I mean, that that was twenty more than twenty years ago now, and the, you know, the, the, the scars from NATO's you know terror campaign against Belgrade are still felt. You know, there are babies yeah. born with birth defects because of the they use depleted uranium, which yeah, Britain thought they do. was a really good idea to send to Ukraine when the, the, the right yeah. were destroyed. You know, there are people yeah. people walk the streets with missing arms and legs. Um, you know, there are still bomb there are still bombed out buildings in the center of in the center of Belgrade. You know, I mean, this yeah. the, 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 this is a, people are reminded every day. Of you know of what happened to them and what was done to them, um, and so yeah, I think that, that this is going to take decades, um, you know, a century even for Ukraine to recover to anything like to you know levels of, in any way that it was before the war, which I might add were not particularly great. Like you know, it was already a, a, a European center for hu- for child trafficking, and um, it w- lost about a third of its economy to, to um, corruption every single year, which is staggering. Um, yeah. So, but yeah. On that on that sad note, I shall bid you adieu. I think. But yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Trish. Oh, I'm so grateful you did it. Thanks very kindly, and good luck to you. And do please uh, keep us in the loop. I'd be grateful to follow your story. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Kit. Bye. Bye bye. So that was my interview with Kit Clarenberg. And watch this space. If um, he is requiring some funding for legal counsel. We'll let you know how to do that because I know you want to contribute if you can. I want to talk to you about an event I'm doing on June 16th, which is coming up. Um, It is in support and celebration of a documentary called Never Again, uh, which is a documentary by Vera Sharav, who you have heard on the show. She was a... um, an early questioner of what really felt like authoritarianism and tyranny falling down upon us during the COVID times. And um, I, I interviewed her because I was thinking very, very much in, a, in an historical sense. I, I actually could not believe how quickly everybody got in line, how obedient people were, how almost welcoming people were to live through a lifting of civil liberties. And that scared me. And I remember we we did an interview with the woman who wrote a book called State of Fear about how behavioral units purposely caused panic and fear in the citizenry in order to get them to obey. And she said to me, That that scared her, but what scared her more was how quickly everybody got in line. And so I was looking for someone who could talk about that in an historical sense, and I found Vera Sharab. Vera Sharab is a Holocaust survivor, and I want to make very clear why I did it. I was not connecting what happened during COVID times to the actual Holocaust itself. 
I would never do that. I, I think they're quite different. But but was not that different was the run up to the Holocaust, the years where the Nazi party was using public health as a way to gain obedience, turn people against each other. The fact that medicine and science, and I'm not talking about the crazy Mengele people, but average doctors and scientists lined up to join the Nazi party and take part in eugenics and other terrible things. So that seemed like a parallel to me. And I wanted to know if Vera felt the same way. And as it turned out, she did. And so we did a show with her and um, it was, it was enlightening and it was also very moving. So I am going to appear with her at this gala dinner event and I'm wanting to invite you to it. You can find out how to uh, get, I, I guess they're offering general seating and various things. Um, but for Friday, which is when I'm going to be there, dinner with Vera and special guests, um, it's in Hamilton, Ontario, and the address will be sent, it says 36 to 48 hours prior to the event. I don't quite know what that's about, but general seating, cash bar, music and dancing, apparently the doors open at 6 p.m. Uh, the tickets are expensive, but as I understand it, the money is going to the production of this film. So if you want to come out and you are a listener of the show, I will be there and will speak to as many people as I can. I think it's going to be an interesting event. So think about it. I'd be very grateful if you did. So um, here's my final thought is about Jamie Foxx. This is very interesting, and I don't traffic in gossip, so understand where this is coming from. But Jamie Foxx was on a movie set in Atlanta. Something happened that was quite drastic. It was all very hush-hush. He was in the hospital. They said he had medical complications, which was very strange. And um, nobody really talked about it, but he seemed to be quite sick. And there were varying stories coming out of friends and relatives of, uh, of Mr. Fox. So the story kind of dies down for a while. And then there's a report that he has been taken to some kind of a rehab facility in Chicago. So that's awful. Something happened, clearly. And there is some reporting today that what happened to Jamie Foxx was something along the lines of a blood clot and a stroke event. And there are some descriptions that he was really quite badly hurt by this event. But what's more interesting is that it is being connected to him getting a vaccine. Now, you know me. I, I do not talk about anecdotal stories a vaccine injury, unless they're super well documented. But what's interesting about this one, and the only reason that I'm bringing it up, I have no evidence that it's tr that that is true. I, I do know this. I know that movie sets in Hollywood are super COVIDian. I'm in the business. I'm working on a documentary, and I can tell you um, that people who are shooting in the states are coming back and saying, "Oh, you've got to wear a mask on set, and you've got to have a vaccine passport, all this crazy stuff, right?" So there is some talk that he he may have been asked to get a vaccine at some point, um, and that that may have contributed to this. I don't have evidence for it, but there it's quite interesting because there, what, the reason that has a little bit of credibility with me is because everybody is being so secretive about it, right? If you were injured by a vaccine and you worked in Hollywood, you could never talk about it because you would be completely shunned for doing so. That's the reality I'm trying to highlight here, even more than people who've had bad results with the vaccine, is the fact that we cannot talk about it without being shunned and called a anti-vaxxer or a nut or a conspiracy theorist, right? So my, here is my point. Again, I don't know about J.B. Fox, but I do know that if something did happen, we may never know about it because everybody is afraid in places that are leaning in that direction 
I mean, this is an industry that was saying, I'm on my fifth booster and I, I just got COVID, but I'm so glad I got my fifth booster because I'd be much sicker. If, I mean, that's what they remember that they were saying that this is Hollywood. So it's a very interesting story. And um, we'll see now that this is kind of bubbling out if the family actually clarifies what happened or not. But um, yeah, like I say, I only am saying this to highlight the point that if it is a vaccine injury, that we probably will never know because they won't talk about it out of fear. That is how effective the propaganda campaign has been. People are afraid to say what has happened to them. <sighs> anyway, stay critical. See ya. See ya.